Please welcome the cast of Me and Earl and the Dying Girl, uh, RJ Kyler, <laughs> Olivia Cook, Thomas Mann, and the director, Alfonso Gomez Rejon. <laughs> Hello all, welcome. All suited and booted, making me look rather, you know, scruffy, which is a, which is a good start. Um, but I, I, this is a, a fantastic film. It, it, it really moved me, and uh, I, I wanted to talk to you first of all about what it was about this subject material, the subject matter that, that drew you in. Alfonso, let's start with you. It started. It didn't start with the subject matter as much as it did with the character of Greg. Um, I I um, I saw myself in him throughout the entire. Uh, uh, the, all of his in, emotional journey throughout the entire film, and I was very surprised because Jesse Andrews, I didn't know him, he was much younger than I was, am, and um, I was surprised at how touched I was, and um, certainly I love the, the way that it dealt with adolescence in a way that, that didn't talk down to them and spoke to me, yeah. and that it celebrated movies, obviously, and, uh, and also this uh, idea that, 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 that uh, uh, even after people die, their, their stories can continue to unfold. And, and I guess in, in my personal life, I guess I was searching for some kind of continuum or, uh, or some proof of that. And, 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 um, and I didn't believe that idea, but I, in the course of making the movie and, and exhibiting the movie, I started to believe that. And I was changed quite a bit by it. Oh, wow. Okay. And, uh, and Thomas, you are Greg in this, the me of the title. Um, did, did, did the character speak to you as well in the way that he did to Alfonso? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I just love the way that Jesse Andrews writes teenagers. You know, they, they never say the perfect thing, and uh, it's kind of a clumsy way of talking. And, and it was like a lot of teenagers that I know and the kind of teenager that I was. And, um, and I liked that he wasn't a perfectly likable character. You know, he had a lot of growing up to do, and he was, uh, he, the writing sort of embraced the selfishness and stubbornness of teenagers which I just thought was very honest, and um, it was something, something that felt different from a lot of coming-of-age scripts that I'd read and, and coming-of-age movies that I'd been a part of before, and uh, so I just I knew it was something that I could sink my teeth into. and was really funny, but also had this great emotional weight to it. Mm. And uh, Olivia, you play Rachel, the dying girl of the title. Um, again, can you talk about the connection to the character? Uh, I, think, I think I just like the fact that she wasn't written as a teenage girl that's really insecure and um, self-deprecating and has, is just riddled with um, all these things that she hates about herself. Rachel's really confident and, and she likes herself and I just think it was really refreshing to read a female character of that age that was like that. And obviously, you know, you've done accents before, but that, you know, in the, in the movie, that is an incredible accent. Uh, where did you study? How did that come about for you? Um, I am on a TV show that films in Vancouver and I have a great dialect coach in Vancouver when I'm on that show so I, I try and practice the exercises that she taught me when I'm not doing the show and so, so I kind of passed it on for this this movie as well. Yeah. And I think I had a Skype with her just to like a refresh. <laughs> just a refresh. And uh, RJ, you are Earl? That's me. Who is Earl? Did, did he speak to you, sir? Earl is this this hot chocolate fella. No, I'm playing. Um, <laughs> Earl is really just, uh, he's the best friend of, of Greg and um, a newly found friend of Rachel. Um, he's just like, uh, he doesn't say too much in the movie, but what he says always is something that you have to think about. He's just like the moral compass. He's a small moral compass, but he's still cute, <laughs> and he's, you know, he, he's just that person that makes you think, and, you know, he, he's the voice of the audience, if you will. Everything that the audience wants to say, Earl will say it, you know, just, that's that fella. Absolutely. It's your first film as well. It is my first baby. How did that come about for you? Um, well, four score and seven years ago, um, <laughs> no plan, but um, I, I, I got the audition from my managers while I, were, I was um, playing Xbox, which is a very constructive activity, I know. It, it leads to great futures. And um, they knew that I was playing Xbox, and it was like, RJ, put the Xbox controller down. It scared me a little bit, because um, that's a little creepy, but, and I, I started reading, and I just fell in love with the script. I couldn't stop reading it. I read it twice that day, actually, and I was just like, you know, it's, it's so honest, and it's funny, and it's not pulling for anything, and so I went and auditioned with Angela, and I, I think she liked me. Um, as an as a actor, I think I did a good job at the audition. Then I met Thomas, and I was 
kind of nervous before I met Thomas because I, you know, watched him on on movies. He's on my instant cue and you know Netflix. So that's oh, really, a little, okay. yeah. That's, yeah. Well, all of them are really yeah. uh, Bates Motel uh, for Olivia and you know American Horror Story for Absolutely. Alfonso yeah. and Hansel and Gretel is on my iPad. So that happens. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, then then she called me back and. Um, <laughs> And it was like, uh, my managers called me and was like, okay, they, they want to make an offer. And I was in Missouri at the time. And I screamed like a girl. I did. <laughs> it happens out of every grown man. And, um, you know, it, it was a dream come true, really, that I had the opportunity to, to work with such amazing people. Like, literally, they're the best that I could ever, you know, ask yeah. for. And now everybody else has to live up to them. Like, I love these <laughs> guys, to be honest. You're not going to quit, are you? You know, that's, that's I don't know. They, you probably, thank you guys for sending me into early retirement. I love you so much. But I know, you know, it's just certain people Stay that you us. meet. In, yeah. Yeah, yeah you'll be fine. By the way, people. Angela is Angela Demore, our casting director. Okay. Yeah, sure. AJ talks I'm like so everyone sorry. knows everyone. I'm <laughs> sorry. Angela and I apologize. There's no Angela. Everyone knows Angela. Uh, Alfonso, how difficult was it to find the perfect Greg and Rachel for this? You know, it's... <laughs> It's tedious, and you see a lot of people, and then it's quite easy the second you know who it is. The second someone walks into the room, you know who it is, and the second Olivia had a gut feeling about her, that, that an instinct that felt like she was right, Thomas as well, RG as well, and then it's about pairing them together and hope that they work as a couple. Uh, and that's where it gets tricky. Um, you don't want to be wrong. You know, I really wanted Thomas, but if the chemistry was different with, between him and Olivia, you know, it's a, a, you can't... That, that, that will not work because it'll lead an audience to expect a love story. And they had, uh, luckily, uh, and sometimes the camera and these chemi the chemistry tests are so important because the camera sometimes captures something that you can't see when you're there in front of them. Something feels a certain way, then when you play it back, there's another thing happening that's kind of a mystery and that's kind of the, the fun part of making film films. And um, luckily, when I paired them together, uh, it was immediately clear that uh, they were the right uh, Greg and um, Rachel. But then he a... saw loads of other people after Ooh. that. <laughs> they were the first two Greg and Rachels to read together, and then he saw a bunch of other people, and Just then to make three sure. weeks later he made the decision. Yeah, yeah absolutely. The thing is, yeah. when you see, when you start, you know, yeah. in my defense, <laughs> when you start the audition process, you see, you do one or two scenes, and you keep it moving, you keep it moving, there's a lot of people to see, and then by the end, Thomas was, and Olivia were auditioning with like 30 pages of scenes at that point, and, and there's a lot, it, when you see the movie, there are a lot of uh, different emotions throughout. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm not only uh, is, is Thomas is carrying the film, but he's also in some ways carrying me. And, I, and, and um, so you really had to make sure that this is the right uh, chemistry, the right uh, um, casting, because uh, if that's wrong, the whole movie is wrong. And um, after the last chemistry read, I'll start that, uh, that way. It was very clear that uh, they were perfect. There was an intense connection that was beyond. It wasn't a traditional love story. It was about love. And it was an intense connection. And it was very clear that they were right. And then when RJ came along and saved the movie, really, because we had no Earl in the Me and Earl and Dying Girl, then it was about chemistry reading him and, and Thomas together. And then they had a wonderful connection. And then once the three of them got together, it, was, uh, it at least appeared to be very effortless. Yeah. You guys must have thought, once we were done with school, that's it. No more chemistry tests for us. But then you go into this. Um, I know it's a surreal experience. I imagine auditioning, where you put yourself out there anyway, is quite surreal. But what's a chemistry read like? Is that, does that feel even weirder, I guess, than auditions? It is weird, because it's kind of testing something that you can't really see, and that's not very tangible. It's completely abstract. And, you know, you can, you can think that you get on in real life, but then when you act together and then you're on camera... Sometimes it doesn't transcend, and it is strange. It's it is. I actually prefer it because you're. It's it's more much more real than reading with a casting director sitting behind a camera. You know, it's it's much closer to the real thing. And me and Olivia sort of cheated. We got together the night before and and had dinner and sort of broke the ice that way. It was like an actor's blind date, and it worked. And I mean, obviously, but um, you know, <laughs> it, it was great. We, we felt like we were on the same team when we got in the room together. Did you know about the cheating? Did you know that they got together the night before? Well, we I don't think I did. Okay. We didn't tell Otherwise. you. First time we've told you. Yeah, bombshell, no. bombshell. Um, well, let's take a look at the, uh, the guys in action. And let's, here's a clip from the movie now. This is the first time that uh, Greg and Rachel speak after Rachel's diagnosis. Take a look. So I just want to talk. The, the, the film is very funny, Alfonso, but it's also very moving as well. I want to talk about the tonal 
tightrope you, you walk as a, as a director. Can you talk about that, trying to capture that, that, that essence of, of, of funny, sad at the same time, but not going too far in one direction? Well, you hope you, you keep playing with it until they take the film away from you. I think someone said to me that... Um, so you still be editing right now. Oh, yeah, the films, <laughs> yeah. films aren't, aren't released, they escape. Yeah. And it's so true, you know. Uh, um, you need deadlines sometimes, otherwise you'd still be tweaking the volume, a half decibel here. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll answer by, by quoting, you know, the, the, the person behind most of the movie, the, most of the music in the film is Brian Eno. And uh, when he committed to the film... Um, to working on the film and then eventually writing for the film, he wrote an, me an email and he said that the reason he liked the film was that it captured um, that in life there is a swirl of emotions. There is, uh, there is never one constant emotion and he never, when he writes music, wants to have, uh, write a piece of music that only has one tone and one feeling, that life is about these... Um, contradictory emotional currents crashing into each other. And I don't know if the film captures that, but that was the goal. Uh, and he, it was his words, not mine, but the, the idea is to feel something uh, authentic, to have a genuine emotional kind of journey. Uh, I needed one for, uh, for a lot of reasons, and, and I would, if I had to manufacture an emotion to make you feel, and maybe you would cry, that would wear off and you might resent it, but I think if, you, if you're respectful of the audience and you allow them to go on their own journey, and if they feel great, if they don't, that's fine too, but give them the choice and respect their journey, I think that was very important to me, and, and that was the hope. Uh, and it's up to you to decide after you see the film. Absolutely, and, uh, and for the actors as well, how difficult is it to make sure you're hitting the right tone as actors through a film like this? I mean, the, the script was so good, and um, it, it just seemed to flow so naturally from, from the funny parts to the parts where it makes you really, you know, feel something. And, um, and then also Alfonso was great at kind of bringing the comedy down. It was always about doing less, which ended up making the scenes work better and making them funnier. And um, so it was like, a, it's just little calibrations here and there, but the writing was so good that I just kind of understood Greg immediately. And... Um, and, and like you said, you can't have the light without the dark. They coexist constantly in life, and so you just had to trust the script, and, and that was that. Uh, Olivia and RJ as well. I mean, we didn't go into each scene as oh, this is this is comedy, <laughs> uh, and then the, you know the one the other one like this is sad now, guys. Um, it was it it we were often surprised actually how a scene when you read it it was so so hilarious and how it kind of shifted when we got up to, to do it and we played it out, it kind of, it, 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 uh, we're, we're often really surprised to find just hidden emotion and sometimes we found, especially the, there's a scene in, in Rachel's bedroom where a big gag was taken out because it was just deemed kind of too insensitive for the moment. Okay. So we just went along for that. It was funny. But it was really funny. In context and then out of, you know, it's, it always changes. Absolutely. But I imagine it was quite fun because um, uh, another part of the film as well, I think you talked about it earlier on, is that uh, Greg and Earl make films. They, they're you know, short films inspired by classic movies. Uh, there's a lot of Werner Herzog references in the movie, hence my T-shirt. Um, was that fun for you guys to shoot all that, all that sort of stuff? And Alfonso, did you, did you direct those, those bits no, as well? No, no, I mean, Ed, Ed Bursch and Nate Marsh made the films. I'm obviously, I'm, I'm behind the, the, the choices of what films that were very important to me once you get involved to start personalizing the movie and this is an opportunity to pay homage to the people that influenced me and and it's part of the journey is when it when you're part of a project that you don't initiate or you don't write to then there's a there's an there's a part where you have to start making it your own so you can be, feel more connected to it and having references that ref, that 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 I don't know that give thanks to the people that influenced me was very important to me but it was impossible to do everything, and as a former second unit director, I, I, I had a lot of faith in, in two young filmmakers from Pittsburgh who I entrusted with creating those films as if they were Greg and Earl at 9, at 10, at 15, at 17. And so we would then choose what films to pay homage to, what scene to pay homage to in, in that film, and how old were they when they made that specific parody, and what equipment okay. did they use. Okay. So there's a lot of thought went into it, and then it's about letting them um, be creative. Fantastic. So, did you have fun making those those short films, guys? Oh yeah. 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 We made most of them in um, the first day of, uh, of 
uh, shooting, and it was just like us in a minivan with a bunch of costumes. It was very, very uh, guerrilla style. It was me, Thomas, Ed, Nate, and a driver. Um, yeah, we got a lot of weird looks, but they were really good weird looks. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, yeah, it was really fun. It was just like doing stuff in high school with your friends, you know, when you make dumb Instagram videos or something like that. You know, it was that fun. So, so yeah. did you have reference points? Did you have clips of the films you were parodying on a computer so you could just make sure you could hit the beats? Yeah, I don't think I even realized we were doing all of them the first day. And so then they're like, we pull up to this park and like, okay, so this is the uh, Klaus Kinski burden of dreams. So get ready to do the accent. And then so Jerry Sullivan, our production designer, is like yelling at me in a German accent, like trying to get it, and then I'm watching this YouTube clip over and over again, and then, you know, we're in the park, there's kids running around, and I'm like cursing at the top of my lungs in, in this Klaus Kinski voice, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was, it was great. I don't know. It was rare. You never get to do stuff like that in, in like a professional, real film, you know? <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, we've got one more clip now, and then you guys can ask some questions if you have any. Uh, and this, this clip is uh, a scene between uh, Greg and Earl and Rachel. Um, I should probably say, Alfonso, I don't know how to set this up in a way, but uh, let's say Greg and Earl have consumed some illicit substances. Accidentally. Accidentally consumed some illicit substances before this clip begins, which explains why Greg is not entirely present in the scene. <laughs> Take a look. So, um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Burning question, who was in the costumes? Uh, uh, yeah, the PA, his name is uh, DJ. DJ. And uh, so. Chung Wun Chung, uh, yeah, Chung Wun Chung, who's oh. a cinematographer, his translator, oh. uh, so. Saul. Uh, Chung Wun Chung had a translator around that he didn't really need, so we just tortured him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was an astrophysicist, 20 year old from Korea, who happened to be in Pittsburgh and needed some money for a summer job. Little did he know he was getting into uh, <laughs> working on, it was a dream job for any other Korean filmmaker who had get to work <laughs> with, with, with Chung Wun Chung, the greatest cinematographer, and, and, and so incredibly famous too. He's, he, he shoots uh, all of uh, director Park Chan Wook's work. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and there he was. He had no idea what he was getting into. And uh, the first couple of days, you have to wake him up because it's like day 10. <laughs> uh, day, day, day two, and he was falling asleep on this. Uh, uh, but uh, so we would just put him in costumes. Why not? Why not? Were you tempted to get in yourself? Never. Not once. Never? Okay. Um, if you have any questions now for Alfonso and uh, Thomas, Olivia, and RJ, then do put your hands up. Uh, there is a hand right there in the center. I think we have some microphones. We're going to try and get one around to you. You just keep your hand up so we can. There we go. Thank you. Um, it was it was referenced that um, kind of it, it's a very intense film. The scenes were intense in parts, and it was a quite a short schedule you you filmed on. Was it hard to kind of go through so much every day and not let it take its toll on you? Yeah, for the actors, sure. Uh, for, well, you as well, oh, I suppose. Oh. Um, it always took its toll, but it was good to feel again, you know? I, I, I threw myself into this film, as did everybody, not only here on, uh, on stage, but the entire crew, uh, every crew member really threw themselves into this film and poured their heart into it, and you can feel it. And uh, it, was, it, was, um, it was good to feel. I felt very much alive, and, and if you had to cry, you cried, and if you laughed, you laughed, and so did everyone around you. And it was very, very intense and very hard to say goodbye to the... Uh, the last day of production was very difficult and for a lot of reasons, not only because of the scene that we were shooting, but it was, it was also saying goodbye to an experience that I did not want to end. Yeah, it was mostly a lot of fun. Even the days that were really heavy, um, it, it was so, it was heavy for the right reasons and you felt very full and uh, like you just, you know, we got what we wanted to. If, it, if, it, if we had to cry, you know, throughout the day, then that, so be it. But. Um, the crew was great at unwinding. We um, we had we always got together. Everyone liked to. Well, there were a bunch of big partiers. Everyone liked to hang out after work, and so that was really great. And it just felt like a big family, and everyone was there for the right reasons. So it was it was mostly fun the whole time. Yeah, it felt like summer camp. Um, it felt like we were on um, what's it called? Like a team building exercise with. No, I didn't. That was. The <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, Molly Shannon says it was like arts and crafts camp because everyone was just off making things and everyone was buzzing around and everyone was just so enthused and excited to just come to work every day, which never really happens. You can never really say that for the cast and everyone on the crew as well. 
Yeah, for me, um, since it was my first, you know, time or whatever, and I'm a little, you know, I'm like a ball of um, Red Bull, so I don't get tired, really. Um, so after we would finish shooting, I would just be ready to go again, you know, because these guys are amazing. Like, the whole time I was just like, okay, are we working today? Then they'd be like, no, RJ, you got a day off, and then I'd be mad, a little sad, you know, just like this much. And sometimes I'll just come hang out on set because that's how, you know. There was always, yeah. was a, I'd be shooting, and there's RJ. It's like, am I, what am I doing today? Am I doing another scene? <laughs> he just came to hang out. Why not? Why not? Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. There's a, there's a lady here. Hello. Uh, so my question is for Alfonso, uh, right here. Um, and I just wanted to know what contributes to your decision to move forward with a movie? Um, I... There was a, uh, it was the first time in a very long time that I saw... I, I knew that in my personal life I was getting away from the films I, I thought I'd be making at that point in my life. I thought I'd have a career making personal films and, and uh, it was taking longer to get there. And I was very lucky at the same time I was doing really wonderful... Uh, I was a part of a very wonderful show, a, seri a series of shows that uh, allowed me to be very creative and an experiment and that was uh, very fulfilling to a point at some point you want to start telling personal stories and of course you're writing and you're developing your own material but they just take so long and they fall apart uh, you know and uh, then when I read the script it touched me deeply and I was surprised at how deeply it touched me how personal I thought it was to me and then I found a way to personalize the movie and and really it was, uh, it, it was very much in sync with who I was at that point in my life and I wanted to be, by the end of the film, not only believe the message of the movie, um, but be on the path of putting myself together the way Greg was. And um, so that really uh, excited me. It scared me if I didn't get the job. And I worked very hard to, tr to, to try to win it. And I did, thank God. <laughs> and uh, now there's a question from the gentleman over here. Thank you. Hello. I have two questions, actually. My first question is to Mr. Alfonso. Um, I'm a short film director, and I'm going to do my first feature film next February. So I would like to ask you, what is the advice that you would give to an aspiring filmmaker just to, in order to make their first feature film? And my second question is the whole, to the whole cast. Is it possible to take a group photo with you after the Q&A? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Possibly not in that one, because oh, they so have to go possible. straight to somewhere that has uh, yes, for, the, uh, for the premiere. But uh, well, you never know. Uh, <laughs> but yes, the, the advice. Sorry, I don't know. Um, I mean, the fact that you're on your way from making short films and then uh, making a feature film, you're in a much better uh, place than a lot of people, other people are. Usually, uh, the advice is to not try to make something that's part of a trend, uh, not try to make something because you think it will be commercial, uh, because your voice will be lost. On, on the way, and, and usually the, the best advice is try to do something personal and something that you can actually finish. Uh, a lot of people keep working on the same screenplays for decades or years because it's hard to finish something because there's a fear of failure, there's a fear of success also. Um, so uh, the fact that you seem to be have finished a short and are on the way to make a feature um, is, is you probably need less advice than other people because you already have a certain, um, you're probably a very ambitious and um, probably stubborn as well, and I commend you for that. And, and uh, so I, I think um, as long as you stay true to yourself and don't get lost in the game of trying to make something because you think it'll be commercial, uh, I think if you make something personal, whatever that your sensibilities might be, those will shine and, and, and not be afraid to finish the film, exhibit the film, show it, be rejected, go back and do what you can to fix it. Um, and, then, and then I'm sure it'll lead to much success or at the very least lead to another film. And whatever happens, you still have to pick yourself up and make another one or win an award and then make another one. <laughs> you, uh, you worked in your uh, career with the likes of Martin Scorsese and uh, Alejandro Gonzalez in Ritsu. Did you ask them for advice before you started working this one? Not this one, and Nora Ephron. I always have to mention her. Nora She's Efron, very course, important yes. to me. Yeah. Um, you, you, they speak to you even when you're not asking them for advice. You know, just observing the way they handle situations, problems, realize their uh, their ideas, uh, communicate their vision, 
uh, seeing how they deal with success and failure. I think all of that it starts to you start to soak everything in. Um, there's been a couple of occasions where I've specifically asked uh, for advice um, to Nina Scorsese and Thelma Schoonmaker Powell, who is married to Michael Powell. Um, but usually, you don't want to ask favors. I'm in a, I don't want to ask any of these favors. And but you've learned your lessons, hopefully, along the way. Um, about why to make movies, not how, really, because you can't copy their style. That, that's them, you're you. Um, but uh, it's more about the why. And yeah. that usually, if you, don't, if you can't answer why are you making this movie, there's a problem. And, uh, and guys, Thomas, Olivia, and RJ, I mean, as, as young actors make any way in the business, who do you turn to for advice? Oh, Alfonso. Yeah. <laughs> Alfonso's our role model. Yeah. He's our so easy, God. such He's an easy idol. idol. I turn to, okay. I turned to Siri. Let me take. No, I'm playing. I'm, it's mostly Alfonso. He and he checks on me a, a lot. Good you know. answer. The an answer is we're at the Apple <laughs> Store. Again. Siri, but, um, <laughs> Siri gives excellent advice. By excellent. Way. Excellent career advice. Uh, any? We've got time for I think one last question. Right at the very back here. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, this is sorry. This is for the whole cast. Um, I imagine playing these roles was kind of, I guess, challenging given the subject matter. But were you able to take any experience from? your personal life or anything to play them? We get asked this question a lot, and I think for, for all of us, um, if we're not moved enough by the story that we have to pull from our personal lives, and there's a bit of a problem, we probably shouldn't be doing <laughs> that movie. Um, and that wasn't the case with this, because it was just so emotive, and Jesse Andrews just wrote a beautiful script and the direction from Alfonso was kind of all we needed and just my fellow actors to really get there emotionally and in, in, in the comedic times as well because we just all have such a wonderful chemistry together I think, I hope. Yeah, I mean it is such a specific story and, and you know I, I've lost grandparents to cancer as you know most people probably have and uh, it's affected so many people but but um, in, in other ways, you know, I, I connect to Greg because, you know, you, when you see kind of less admirable parts of yourself in a character, it forces you to want to kind of explore that and sort of grow up with a character. And, um, and yeah, it kind of hit an emotional chord with me because, you, you know, I saw a lot of myself in him and it's just something you kind of want to work through things. And that's why an acting can be very therapeutic in a lot of ways. Maybe it shouldn't be, but... Um, but yeah, I found that was definitely a, 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 I, I, I had a hook in him, and I, um, I I wanted to kind of dig into this story and kind of pour myself into it for that reason. Yeah, I wouldn't, um, you know, as as Thomas said, my you know my grandmothers both had you know had cancer, and, and that's what you know um, happened to those two beautiful women. But you know, it wasn't something that I had to. Um, draw upon, you know, because I'm not usually a, an emotional person. I know it seems like I'm very emotionally distraught. I know, I understand. But um, it was just um, usually, you know, just what came out of the script and then direction by Alfonso. Like, he can pull emotion out of this whole room in, like, 35 seconds. Um, it, it's amazing, all right? Um, you know, and it was just that, and also the help of, of Thomas and Olivia, and, it, you know, it just works. And it's also so specific to the story as well, yeah, so. Did you, uh, did you want your actors to do some research into into? Well, Olivia and I did some research together. Yeah. Um, it, it was important that, um, like for, for instance, like Thomas and, and, and RJ, it, would, it was important to me that, that, that at least they were aware of some of the films that we were referencing. Um, but for Olivia, it was, um, we wanted to make sure that we got the details of her cancer correct. And, and we both did research and mapped out uh, her uh, journey throughout the film and uh, how she was feeling when and how many, when did she turn le legally 18 to make certain decisions in her life and mapped it out and that was a chart that, 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 went in that was related to the entire crew because it affects costume and wardrobe and I mean makeup. And, um, so of course we wanted to make sure that, that it was never gonna be a documentary but we wanna make sure that the details were, were at least correct so that that journey, those, if people have gone through that experience that they could connect to it and, 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 and find it honest. Because of course the, uh, the straightforward thing to do would be to shoot that uh, chronologically but I imagine with an independent movie with a tight schedule 
that's not a luxury that you can afford. It's impossible. I mean, yeah. it, we try to a point. Uh, you do as much as you can until it becomes cost prohibitive. It, if we had all the money in the world, yes, you should it in chronological order, and it makes sense, and it helps the actors. The best thing for the actors, more than for the directing, is for the, the actors. But we did what we could, and of course, Olivia really did shave her head for the role. So that boxed us, it forced us into some sort of chronological order. But, um, but So we did our best that at least her scenes had some kind of uh, uh, chronological order to them. Um, but, um, but yeah, the dream is to make the entire movie that way, but it's not usually the case. Uh, and actually, that's a note on which we're going to end. It's a fantastic movie. I do urge you all, uh, all to go and see it. Uh, please give it up for RJ Kyler, Olivia Cook, Thomas Mann, and Alfonso Gomez-Lejon. Thank you very much. Thank you.